Uh, I'm Zana, and yeah, that's how you spell my name. Uh, I've, as you mentioned, got a seven-year background in digital fabrication, working with Fab Labs, uh, and also been working with uh, different forms of activism. Uh, stem from a, a syndicate youth group in Sweden. <laughs> um, so, what is Scuttlebutt? So you kind of have a decent introduction. I don't think anyone as of yet has done this. How many people knew about Beaker Browser before we got here? Hands up. All right, that's quite a few. Uh, how many people knew about Scuttlebutt before we got here? Oh, that's quite a few and different people too. That's interesting. Okay, how many people knew that there was something out there that was like another web? Oh, that's a few more. Okay, we getting there. <laughs> well, okay, for those of you who are very new to this, we'll be going through it again, but very slowly. So to surely like establish the understanding. Um, but to give a back like brief, we talked about DOT and Beaker Browser, and that's one protocol. And then we have IPFS, and then we have Scuttlebutt. And those are the three big ones. Three. <laughs> um, so I'll be talking about Scuttlebutt, You've learned about Beaker Browser and DAT, and DAT is like the internet as we know it. Scuttlebutt, on the other hand, is more of the social sharing. Um, so yes, it's a sailing term for water container. It's slang um, for gossip. Um, this is, I don't know if you use Slack ever, there's this like water cooler uh, channel. It used to be, I don't know if it still is. Um, but yeah, it's where sailors would go to gossip. Um, it was created on a boat for off-grid communication by Dominic. Uh, he lives in New Zealand, still lives on his self-sailing boat uh, and communicates via Scuttlebutt. Um, Scuttlebutt is short and in all a peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol. Um, yeah. What's that? So it's not this whole thing we've talked about for a while, like centralized um, communication protocols. So in a regular website or regular communication, you have the domains and you have the users. And in order to get there and to get to the data, you have to go through the central service, through the ISP. Um, so it's more like, what? OK. This. Um, so, yeah, that's Cryptix, or this, which is Andre Stalt's network, or this, which is Mix's network. Um, yeah, actually, it is possible to roam through these networks in 3D and, like, be in the universe of their networks, not only, like, by using the actual application, but, like, there's a platform built for that. Um, we're not going to do that right now, but it's cool. Can recommend. Take some installing to do, but yeah. So simply put, to make it a little bit more clear, this is a network. These are your friends. This is your friends' friends. You can see and store their data. So this is what you can see and store. Okay. Then we have your friends' friends. Friends. So uh, quite a few jumps now. This data you can't see, but you can store. So this data is on your computer and in your log, but you can't see it unless you're using Patch Bay or make some certain special changes to your interface. But you do have the data on your computer, which means other people who are your friends' friends' friends also have your data on their computer. It's good to know, privacy, those kind of things. Um, and then we have beyond. This is where it gets interesting and very much unlike the web as we know it. So beyond 
we don't even know it exists. And it's practically impossible to actually see this data. So if you're outside of the three-step radius of your friend zone, or someone is outside of your three-step radius, then you don't know that they exist in this protocol. Which means that you can have isolated islands of communities using this protocol without anyone knowing that that's actually happening. Which is also one of the reasons that currently our estimations are like, mm, maybe there's like 10,500 users, but we don't actually know because it's physically impossible to actually calculate how many users are out there. Um, so, I, that was the basic explanation. Then we have a few extra things, which is pubs. So pubs is a way. Let's say, okay, you know your friends, and you know that your friends have friends, and you know that your friends have friends, and they have friends, but they're not that fun. You want people who are really, really into mushrooms. Not the psychedelic kind, the regular kind. Um, such as, once again, shout out Glyph. You're a great example for this. Um, the mushrooms uh, are so interesting, but you need to find some more people who know some stuff about that. Which means that you can have a pub. And this pub uh, is like a giant friend. Another way to compare it, it's not actually a person, but another way to compare it is like to an actual regular physical pub. So you have your friends and you, and you go to this pub, and there you meet people, and you gossip, and you share a bunch of stories, and then you meet some other people who have no connection to you whatsoever, and you gossip, and you share a bunch of stories, and then you go home, and now you can tell your friends about the gossip about people you had no connection to, in turn. And that's how pubs work. Which is also a great way to kind of explain that this new communication protocol we're building is, in a sense, um, replicates the actual human interactions. So the way this protocol is built, unlike the centralized service systems, which if you would actually work with like a replication of those, you'd have all the information going through one giant person who would store all the information, look at all the information, send it to another person who would store all the information, etc. This way, it's actually the same way that our interactions work. Um, so yes. Uh, so these kind of protocols, or especially Scuttlebutt, has these kind of quirks to them. Um, the I'll be going through them one on one. These are randomly kind of selected, but interesting quirks that you would not be able to do or expect from regular protocols. So we got communal data privacy. So this means it's impossible to see others' data in, unless they're in the same ne network proximity. That's what we talked about earlier with the whole friends, friends, friends thing. Um, then we have offline usability. This is one of the most interesting quirks, which goes for DATS, it goes for IPFS, and it goes for Scuttlebutt as well. Um, it's, I haven't really made it up here, but I'll quickly explain. Um, it's when you combine torrent-like sharing with a version control such as in Git and a, a distributed ledger such as in blockchain, at least some blockchains. Um, and you get this uh, beautiful in collaboration where you can be offline and still communicate or sync your data later on at least with your peers which means that Scuttlebutt is very mm, suitable for mesh networks, for example. Because if you have a mesh network, I don't know how many of you have used mesh networks, but you might have had the experience that you try and use it and it's patchy and it's frustrating. <laughs> well, with this, it doesn't, it's not patchy anymore because it's using the version control that's continuously syncing and you already have the data on your computer which means that it becomes a smooth transition. Um, so, or smooth experience. Um, so yeah, 
uh, it also means that you can use this over sneaker nuts. Sneaker nuts is basically you take a USB, you store the data, you share it with your friends, and suddenly you have access to the data in the same protocol ish. Yeah. You get it. You can share your log. <laughs> And then we have another quirk, which is one of my favorites in Scuttlebutt, which is free listening. So free li listening is rather than a top-down functionality where you have censoring of the data. You have someone saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. You have a choice to block. So if I go online, I can see, OK, this person has been blocked by one of my friends. Maybe that's information. I don't want to access, or maybe that's information where I don't want them to access my information. Um, so then I have the choice to block them, which is, in a sense, free listening. It's rather than censoring. Um, then we also have the fourth quirk, which is that it's hardware bound, um, which means that Scuttlebutt, SSB, is the name of the protocol. Um, Scuttlebutt accounts are tied to the device that they're on. It's possible to kind of move them to different accounts, and people are kind of looking at doing it, but it's not something that's currently being done. So when someone has an ID, it's tied to that whatever computer or mobile phone they're using. Um, yeah. So it's more difficult also to like swarm the networks, um, ish. Probably could be done, but um, but that means also, what if you lose your device? Because obviously, if it's tied to the hardware it's on, if you lose your hardware, what do you do? And that's why we have these beautiful people called dark. No, they're not people, but beautiful group of dark crystal. So we have a little talk here with. Uh, Dan, um, who I hope this works with. Oh, wait, I just realized I might still have a Bluetooth connection here. Let me check. Uh, is the sound on? Maybe. Assumption that the human or... <laughs> OK, we'll restart it. <laughs> uh, OK. Um, at the core of peer-to-peer -peer technologies is the assumption that the human or machine or other entity interacting with the protocol is the sole custodian of a private key. Um, Try and imagine something really precious, which if you lost it, you would lose access, capacity, and affordances. Um, so I'm not talking about a passport or a bank card. Those things, you can go to a central authority and you can replace them. If you lose your password to Facebook, you could go through some process, such as showing them an identity card or some other identifying feature, which they would determine binds to you, the human, who is the owner of that account. In peer-to-peer -peer systems, there, there is no company. There's no um, central authority to whom you can go and jump through whatever process to regain access. So uh, if you lose your private key, you are uh, screwed in P2P world. Um, this is your digital identity, and if you lose it, you're screwed. That's very fragile. Uh, password managers are hard. Um, about 17% of all Bitcoins which have, will ever be minted have statistically looked like they've been lost. If you literally can't pay people to keep this stuff secure, I think it indicates that it's a ripe problem to solve. And that's really what we've been working on with Dark Crystal. If you're a Harry Potter geek, think Horcrux. If you're not a Harry Potter geek, it's um, a mechanism which leverages human relationships and trust. And you weave a spell saying, um, of my five friends, let's say my mum, my dad, two brothers, and my best friend, as long as three of these people out of the five confirm 
and grant me access, then you can regain the original um, secret. In this case, it might be a private key. Um, without themselves holding the shards, the piece, revealing anything to them. So it's pretty exciting. Hope that helps. Yes. So that was Dan, and he's founder of Black Hates. A uh, wonderful person. Um, I have so much more of his talk, but unfortunately, that's for another time. Um, so, to quickly recap a little bit, um, basically, you can use this for anything. You can use it for Bitcoin, private keys, or what's it called? Bitcoin hashes? Yeah. Uh, I'm not a crypto person. Um, so, uh, or you could use it for, for example, which I would really need because I keep losing my computers. Um, <laughs> Uh, for your private key on a scuttlebutt or any other secret that you really, really want to keep secret um, and store. So you take that secret and you break it up into small blocks and then you give them to your friends. And then when you lose it, you request them back. And since each of your friends has a piece of it, you can restore the whole thing. And uh, that's how it works. Um, yes. But really, though, if you want to get onto Scuttlebutt, how would you use that? So the main interface that most people use is Patchwork. It's the one that's recommended to start with, but there are many more because Scuttlebutt is, once again, it's a protocol. It's not an application. So it's a protocol, which means you can build tons of applications on top of it. Um, so you got Patchwork, you got for mobile, Manyverse, shout out Andres Staltz, who recently released it. Um, I think we gained like, I don't know, it's been like a month, maybe 2,500 new accounts. I don't know, something like that. Um, Patch Bay. Um, Patch Bay is uh, also very lovely, uh, has like GIFs, and it's more of a blog interface with a lot of other applications built into it. It's easy to build um, applications, I've heard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Tic Tac and uh, more specialized applications such as chess. Pretty much anything that's social you can build. Book review applications, there's music applications, there's skill sharing applications. What a beautiful interface, by the way. Um, so yeah. That's it. Welcome to the Scuttleverse. <laughs>